So we've talked a lot about disruptors, and I think it's probably fair to say that JetSmarter is definitely one of the most disruptive companies out there. And Sergey uh, and, uh, is leading the way with jet sharing. So we're delighted that he's come over here, I, I assume by Jet Sh Smarter Shuttle, to talk to us. And I'm now going to hang over to Sergey Petrosov from Jet Smarter. Can that, okay, there you go. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Alistair. It's a great event. Uh, it's uh, my first time here. I was in Miami. Um, this is exciting. Uh, part of what I want to do today is a uh, try to explain what Jet Smarter is to many, because to many we're probably an enigma. Uh, and what I also like to do is to share our perspective on the marketplace. We have a very unique view as to where this market is going, where it's heading, and I'll show you guys um, what we've accomplished so far. So let me grab this clicker. So a quick little view about Jet Smarter. We are actually a pretty big business. Um, you know, we're a nine-figure business growing at over 100% a year. Uh, we, you know, this year uh, with that growth, we think we'll do over 30,000 occupied segments. Uh, we fly an annual passenger volume of 115,000 people. So that makes us the second largest private aviation company in the world behind NetJets by passenger volume. Uh, and if we keep growing, we'll be the biggest. Uh, probably in 12 months. Uh, we're adding uh, members very fast, and uh, Europe um, is growing uh, really well too. I think we're doing about 200 occupied segments a month. Uh, right now, you know, represents about 13% of the business. Uh, London, of course, is a focus of ours. Um, what we think is at the center point of uh, the marketplace and really where and how we're innovating and disrupting the space is a concept we call jet sharing. So uh, what jet sharing does and uh, how, how we deliver it is extremely unique, but what it does is we believe it solves a fundamental problem for the existing flyer and it also opens the doors for a much broader audience. And it, it helps uh, stimulate the marketplace uh, in a really unique way. We actually fundamentally believe that jet sharing is something that people want. This is something that the customer is actually yearning for. Um, they just don't necessarily realize it. And you know, we've, uh, we're, uh, our numbers, if anything, are proof of that. Right? You know, we're converting a significant amount of existing customers uh, to a new platform. Um, and once they learn that they're not losing any piece of convenience, and I'll explain as to how that is, why so many are converting to it. First and foremost, this is just a high level. Um, you know, 85% of the traffic in business aviation is light and mid-sized airplanes. Um, and we can take that same customer and let's call it, you know, the average load factor in the space is 25, 30%. So you take two or three customers, take them out of a Citation or a Learjet and pluck them into a heavy jet with a cabin attendant for half the money or a quarter of the money. Uh, without losing any piece of uh, consistency or uh, any value proposition, uh, uh, such as time. And I'll explain how we do that, uh, but this is sort of high level what the value proposition is. And I used a few examples out of, out of London, um, you know, for what a traditional charter would cost if you have a jet card versus what an on-demand flight with us would cost uh, in a better experience. So, Sort of going back to the roots, sort of walk you into how all this happened. You know, when we first started, we ran sort of an internal study, uh, sort of a blind study, and we gathered a, a bunch of private jet customers, and we said, you know, would you be willing to share an airplane? And we sort of insinuated in the fact that you'd probably lose some consistency, you could lose some uh, time savings, or you know, there could be some loss in flexibility. And of course, even if they could save money, 80% of them said no. Um, because they thought that they'd lose the one fundamental commodity that they're buying is time. And then we took a different group and we asked them uh, a question in a little bit of a different way. We said, hey, you know, uh, what are the two, uh, two main reasons that you fly private? First and foremost, and this is by far the reason that private aviation exists, is time. People buying back time. They want to go out of their airport, they want to go at the time that they want, and they're willing to pay 10, 15, 20 times more to do it. Uh, so 
time is by far the number one reason why people fly. And number two uh, will fall into sort of the convenience of not having to go through a commercial airport and you know, what's going on in the USA with the TSA and everything. It's, it's just only getting worse. And, f and fundamentally, a common theme with everybody is what do you hate the most about private aviation? And it's cost inhibitive and the price. Um, you know, there's, there's plenty of, uh, there, there's plenty of uh, private jet customers that fly around today and, you know, every time they get into their airplane, they see the eight or ten empty seats on their plane, they get heartburn. Um, and then we said, well, if you could maintain and keep these two fundamental features of time, and you obviously wouldn't have to go out of a commercial airport, but you could save as much as 50 percent, uh, that statistic flipped, right? So. You know, we, we saw that the, uh, if, if this product was delivered in a manner that the existing private jet customer was used to, uh, they actually want this uh, because they think, they, they believe that the, what they're purchasing is inefficient. Beyond that, the opportunity that existed is that load factors were at 25, 30 percent. So you only have an average of two or three people on an airplane. So if you take those two or three people, put them into a better experience like a large cabin plane with a flight attendant for half the money, that sounds like a good value proposition. So, you know, we fundamentally believe that, you know, there are the major, major themes that are going to dominate the next five years are on demand uh, with a sharing component. You know, this industry is absolutely go it is being flipped on its head and it's going to be flipped in terms of the consumption model for uh, how the majority of customers are going to fly. You'll obviously have a niche of, say, you know, your top. Uh, top 1,000 billionaires in the world that, are, that uh, won't do it personally, but they'll do it for their families, their kids, uh, and, and everything else. But the biggest, biggest challenge for such a business is going to be service consistency. Th this customer is, is used to um, a very unique experience. Uh, it's, and you're asking them to change their behavior to get into an airplane uh, with other people. So being able to deliver the experience in the airplane is fundamental to this success. Uh, we take that to an extreme to the point of we run background checks on every single customer that comes in the program. We screen social media pages of people. We have our own security staffs on the ground. So we actually have a uh, uh, security infrastructure, the only security infrastructure for private aviation. Um, uh, in the United States where we do brat bag screenings. Uh, you know, our board member, uh, the first secretary of Homeland Security, Tom Ridge, has helped us design a security infrastructure so you know that when you're getting on our airplane, it's safe. Um, and beyond that, we actually curate the cabin. We curate who you're sitting next to. We, we understand personalities. We understand what, you're, what, what people like. So we'll put talkers ne next to talkers. We'll put quiet people next to quiet people. And we will we'll try to deliver with uh, the utmost precision, uh, the service. And this is, this is frankly going to be, uh, this is the deal breaker in terms of uh, how, this, uh, how this service needs to be delivered. Um, and what I'd like to now touch on is sort of what we do, right, and how we, what is our service model, what we do in sort of explaining some of the slides before. Um, we have designed a concept which we call social scheduling. So we don't actually, uh, we don't actually uh, intend to run a fixed schedule. Uh, what, uh, what our business and how it's designed uh, at scale is a combination between on-demand and schedule. If you think of you know, a traditional airline today, they completely control the schedule, and a traditional private aviation environment is completely on-demand. And you have these two dichotomies really far apart, and there's a big opportunity in the middle, which is a hybrid is what we've designed. So we say that the on-demand customer, the private jet customer, he still wants to book on-demand. There's a reason why he wants to choose the chime, he wants to choose the airport. And we give that fundamental choice to that person, and we call them our creator. That's the initiator of the flight. They go into the system, they pick, this, they pick a city pair that we offer, say New York, Florida, because I'll use that example on the next slide. They pick uh, Teterboro Airport to Opelika Airport at this specific time, and we'll price out the plane. And let's say, uh, in, in that instance, it'll require that person to buy two or three seats. And they buy those two or three seats, and then we underwrite the other seven or nine, 10 seats on the airplane. And they get posted to schedule. 
So the frequency of the schedule is directly correlated to the amount of customers creating flights. Now, New York, Florida is our biggest business. We're flying that as much as 65 round trips a week. American Airlines flies 60. That's the biggest airline operator. Right? We believe, we believe um, New York, Florida could be a 275, 300 round trip business a week, and it's growing rapidly. Um, and this is how we design the system. It's a hybrid, it's a combination, it's something we call social scheduling. And we think that, that this is the only way to fundamentally solve the time issue for the private jet flyer. You give them all of what they're used to and in a better experience in a better airplane, and you're offering seats to new flyers, new people that come into the marketplace. And to sort of relieve some of the enigma, I'm you know, sharing a little bit of a slide as to why, why, we actually, why this is an amazing business. This is by far, uh, by, by far uh, a, not only a better value proposition, but it's actually uh, an amazing business model. So I use an example here. You have uh, a, a floating fleet operator over here that's called a mid-size airplane. Uh, and we have you know, sort of a jet smarter model. First and foremost, um, like I said, you have, the same two, you have the same two flyers on one side, and we have the same two flyers on this side. We call them creator. Over there, we call it a charter flyer. In your traditional floating fleet model, you're running about 35% deadhead. Your average load factor is about 30%, and let's say you're running 700 hours a year. One thing that you know, uh, fundamentally, um, you know, some companies have realized fundamentally changes their cost, uh, cost profile is the deadhead rate. Some companies have done a really good job to reduce that, like Exojet. Um, and, and that's a major component to the cost side in running, running an operation efficiently. We took that to the next level. We said, well, you have to look into the load factor. Right? We can look into the load factor, and we, we can actually use the rest of the airplane. And beyond that, you can then increase the utilization rate, because you're just flying much more between two specific pairs. So, if you know, we would use, let's say it's a Hawker 800 over here, running between you know, New York, Florida, you get a one-way trip request. Between fixed and variable costs, your all-in rate to operate the plane could be $3,800 an hour. Uh, you're paying a lease, you're paying fixed costs, your variable costs, you're flying at 700 hours a year, you amortize that, that's what it would be. And let's say you sell your charter for 16,000 bucks. There's your business, right? It's all right. The margins are eroding and will continue to erode because more players are coming into the market. Uh, on the right-hand side, first things first, we don't operate deadhead, right? We operate between city fair. We consistently run an airplane back and forth. And the only deadhead would be maybe going between Miami Opelika to Fort Lauderdale International, right? So you Im immediately eliminate that cost. Second is our New York, Florida business right now is running at an 88% load factor, sort of filling up the plane almost completely. And you're, we're running it with massively high utilization. So you can, between fixed and variable cost, let's say you, know, you, lease, the, you lease the used G4 today, uh, you run it you know, 1,500 hours a year, you could bring your operational cost below $4,000. So that segment would cost us about 10. But the biggest difference is, on that side you have one customer. On this side, we have 10, where our initiator comes in, he pays 6,000 versus paying 16,500. He's in a bigger airplane. Then you have a bunch of other seats to sell to your members at a fraction of, uh, of a seat cost, say a $1,000 seat, great value for being on a private jet. And then we also have factored in a companion seat. So if you're not a member, you're bringing a friend, it's a premium to, to go into the program. And this is a 12-seat airplane, right? You can get into 15, 16-seat airplanes. The economics just get better, right? So we, we, we fundamentally believe that not only this is changing the, uh, you know, the service delivery, we actually fundamentally believe that this is uh, the absolutely winning business model um, and great, a great business um, uh, that we've created. And we, we believe that this concept of jet sharing is is not the bottom of the period, pyramid. It's actually going to affect the entire pyramid. It's going to affect all the way from aircraft ownership. Uh, you know, today you have you know, de thousands of depreciating airplanes. People that you know, you're, you're going to affect lots of aircraft owners that are going to want to lease their planes. Uh, aircraft. I can't tell. We have a we have an Airbnb type product for aircraft owners. 
where when they're flying, they can actually sell seats on their airplane. Um, it's going to affect uh, uh, how, how you attract management deals. It's going to affect how, uh, how uh, you deliver uh, service to on-demand customers. We believe this is the pyramid. It's going to be a new foundational service that's going to be able to deliver, uh, deliver a quality solution uh, to the customer and really reinvent the business and be a new core uh, to open up this marketplace across the pyramid. So you know, we think that you know, every company should be looking into jet sharing. And if you're not, um, you know, there, there is a chance uh, of obsolescence. So that's Jet Smarter. And uh, if anyone wants to ask any questions, feel free. Time. Oh, gosh, sorry. It's waking everyone up. We've probably got time for one quick question, if there's one in the room. Yeah, Mike, I'm coming to you. Just very quickly, did you close on the latest uh, fundraise that was being done? And what are you going to do with that money? Um, so we, you mean the last fundraise? Yeah. yeah so we did, uh, we did an institutional round back in August. Um, you know, we're reinvesting uh, all our capital into scaling this business. So before launching new routes, we're focused on increasing uh, flight frequency. So you know, as you can see, we're making markets. We underwrite them until we reach critical mass. So we invest this money. You know, while it's, we're an asset light business, uh, it's capital intensive because you have to make markets. Right? So you're, while New York, Florida is a great business, it's, pro, it's making, uh, you know, our New York, Florida business uh, you know, is delivering eight-figure profits uh, because that's a, it's at 88% loads and you're uh, flying with heavy frequency. Other markets could be at 30, 40% loads. So you have to make them. And that's what you have to invest money into to make your market. And then eventually you can flip. So. Okay, one more question. Yeah, Paul Jebley. Plans to uh, expand into Asia, um, and uh, why or why not? Um, yeah, um, you know, but we think that it would be a very expensive venture to do it right. So, you know, we're interested in Asia, we're interested in uh, South America, uh, but we'd have to a we'd probably look for a partner, and b we'd have to raise additional capital to go into those markets. Yeah. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. Just, no. Just one more. <laughs> Can you introduce me to Christina? Um, I mean, if I really tried, yeah, but probably not. Can I advise you not to? Yeah, okay. And, uh, <laughs> um, final question. How important is Europe? The US, oh, we've got another question for Holger. Okay. Can you explain to us the difference between the Europe and Yeah, so two different things. So one, the operator has to do around a, uh, first comes safety, second comes uh, sort of service consistency. And that we learn throughout the process. Uh, but you know, we have, we have certain, st we have our own internal sort of uh, safety team. And when we onboard the operator, we make sure that the operator that we're bringing on board fits a certain requirement of ours. And then once we start operating, uh, we take feedback from customers we have, a, we have a report on every single flight that happens, uh, and that's part of the, part of the procedures uh, in our operation. And you know, if we don't like uh, service delivery or pilots are, you know, say, being mean to us, we'll make recommendations and try to work with the operator um, in a unique way. And if it's just not working, it's not working. So we, uh, we onboard based on safety, and then we analyze based on service consistency. And from a passenger perspective, um, you know, we tap into databases to run background checks. Um, so we have a few systems that we do. We run background checks on customers. We look if, you know, they have uh, criminal records or other things. If they do, they can't be in the program. They can go to United. Um, and uh, beyond that, uh, we, we try to look at social media pages. We try to analyze behavioral patterns. And then once people are flying, we collect reports on every single flight. So, if you've been uh, you know, belligerently drunk on a few flights or you're inconsiderate to other passengers, you know, we probably kick out uh, as much as 1% of our members from the program. Right? So if you aren't fit to be in the club, we ask you to leave. Yeah. And, and we'd like to make it clear that he's here to talk about his business model. Many of you are not eligible because of your belligerence. <laughs> um. 
Hi. Uh, I was offered a JetSmarter membership by one of your team for five thousand okay. dollars. Um, that's obviously a, a no-brainer. Flying around on private jets for five thousand uh, dollars. What's your burn rate? Uh, so, how long will your latest round of investment take you? Because clearly, uh, at prices <laughs> like that, I'm not surprised that you're getting a lot of people on board. I mean, it's pretty much paying them. Did you buy the product? Did I buy the product? Unfortunately, I'm a competitor, so I think it'll be so, uh, frowned so, upon. So if you didn't buy the product, it's kind of hard to comment. Um, if that, that's really a Cedar product. Uh, you don't get really much for free. It's actually you walk in the door and you have to pay. It's more of a trial type product. So we did that in Europe to build, uh, build our membership program. Um, our business has been cash flow positive many months. Uh, so we are, uh, if we're scaling or growing into many, uh, many different routes, we're actually just reinvesting the money. So any bit of, as you would recall, any burn would be because we're going into more routes or scaling our business. Uh, but, you know, give you an example, our New York, Florida business is profiting over eight figures a year. So we have plenty of profitable routes. We're running this business very well. Um, and we have an aggressive customer acquisition strategy, if that maybe addresses your question. Brilliant. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Sergey. Thank, Thank you. you. Loads of questions.